In the 1940s, rail giants poured their hopes and millions of dollars into steam turbine locomotives, convinced these machines would redefine the future of trains. They achieved breathtaking speeds, shattered engineering expectations, and promised a new era for rail travel. But today they are nothing but lost legends, scrapped, abandoned, almost erased. What disaster, lurking behind all that optimism, made railroads turn away from breakthrough technology they once backed so fiercely? The answer starts when faith in the turbine dream reached its peak. Beneath the surface optimism of the 1940s, a powerful alliance of industry leaders set out to reshape the future of railroads. Baldwin Locomotive Works, General Electric, and the Pennsylvania Railroad formed a consortium that funneled millions into steam turbine research and development. Across the Atlantic, the London, Midland, and Scottish Railway backed their own turbine projects, convinced that rotary motion would finally free steam locomotives from the pounding stresses of pistons and rods. Trade journals like Railway Age filled their pages with bold predictions hailing turbines as the answer to diesel's growing threat. The engineering promise was hard to ignore. Turbines spun at thousands of revolutions per minute, delivering smooth, uninterrupted power. Without the hammering action of pistons, engineers anticipated quieter rides, lighter maintenance, and longer-lasting machines. Fewer moving parts, they argued, meant less to go wrong. The technology drew inspiration from the turbines already driving ships and power plants, proven on seas and in city grids, now poised to conquer the rails. Within company boardrooms, technical reports landed with the weight of prophecy. Designers spoke of theoretical efficiency gains as high as 30% at sustained speeds. The Pennsylvania Railroad's directors approved the construction of the S-2 the largest direct-drive steam turbine locomotive ever attempted. In Britain, the Turbomotive's blueprints promised a new era for express passenger service. Every major player wanted a stake in this revolution. Investments soared, not just in engines, but in specialized shops, test tracks, and new training programs for crews. The promise of rotary motion became a rallying cry for those determined to keep steam alive. On paper, these machines offered the best of both worlds, the raw power of steam refined by the precision of turbine technology. For a brief moment, the future of rail travel seemed to belong to the engineers bold enough to chase it. Steam turbines did more than just inspire optimistic headlines. They delivered breathtaking performance in real-world trials. Nowhere was this more apparent than on the London Midland and Scottish Railway, where the turbo motive numbered 6202 became a living experiment in speed and power. Designed by Sir William Stanier and rebuilt from a Princess Royal Pacific in 1935, the turbo motive swapped out the traditional pistons for a high-pressure turbine spinning at thousands of revolutions per minute. LMS engineers set out to test the limits coupling the locomotive to express passenger trains and pushing it into territory, few steam engines had ever reached. Trial records from the late 1930s and 1940s tell the story. The turbomotive routinely hauled trains of 600 tons at over 90 miles per hour along the West Coast Main Line, sometimes sustaining those speeds for dozens of miles at a stretch. On a celebrated run between London and Crewe, the locomotive clocked mile after mile at speeds that left piston-driven rivals in its wake. Crew logs from the period describe a smooth, almost uncanny ride. No hammering, no vibration, just a steady surge of power that seemed to glide over the rails. Railway magazines of the day captured the excitement and touted the turbo motive as the future of express travel. Engineers and firemen who worked the engine marveled at its quietness and the absence of the familiar pounding from cylinders. The continuous rotary motion meant less wear on rails and running gear, promising longer service intervals and lower maintenance, at least in theory. Test observers noted how the locomotive's turbine, fed by superheated steam at high pressure, 
could maintain full output for extended periods, a feat that conventional engines struggled to match. For a brief time, the turbomotive looked unstoppable, its performance on the open mainline a testament to the vision of its designers. Yet even amid the celebration, hints of limitations began to surface. While the turbomotive dazzled at speed, questions lingered about its appetite for fuel during slower running and the complexity of its reduction gears. But on those high-speed runs, with the countryside blurring past and the turbine singing, the promise of a new era in rail travel beat felt real and immediate. Picture a turbine not as a gentle spinner, but as a machine that lives for speed. Inside, steam rushes through rows of curved blades, spinning the shaft at thousands of revolutions per minute. This is where the magic and the trouble begins. Turbines reach their peak efficiency when running flat out, steam flowing at full pressure, blades slicing through vapor like a propeller through water. Every part is designed for this sweet spot where energy transfer is smooth and losses are minimal. But railroads are not highways. Locomotives crawl through yards, start heavy trains from a standstill, and grind up grades at half throttle. At these lower speeds, the turbine's world falls apart. Steam no longer hugs the blades in neat high-velocity sheets. Instead, it separates and tumbles causing what engineers call flow separation. Below half load, the turbine's efficiency drops sharply, sometimes by 30 or 40 percent. The engine has to burn far more coal or oil to create the same motion. In practical terms, a turbine that sips fuel at 90 miles per hour can guzzle it at 20 miles per hour. Engineers tried to explain it like this. Imagine a sports car built for the Autobahn, Forced to idle in city traffic, the engine chokes, the mileage plummets, and the design's strengths become its weaknesses. Turbines crave steady, high-speed running, something railroads rarely provide. This narrow efficiency band shaped every design choice, from the size of the boiler to the complexity of the gearing. The quest to keep turbines spinning fast, even when the train moved slow, led engineers to some ingenious and sometimes desperate solutions. Test cars trailed behind the turbines, packed with instruments and engineers hunched over notepads. The data they recorded would soon be plotted as the definitive verdict on the technology's promise. On one axis, speed. On the other, pounds of coal or oil consumed per hour. The curve for a conventional piston locomotive stretches across the chart in a steady, gentle rise. It's not perfect, there is a spike at startup and a dip at cruising speeds, but the overall line stays remarkably flat, reflecting a machine that sips fuel at a predictable rate, whether it's easing out of a yard or racing down the main line. Then the turbine's curve appears. At the right edge, 70, 80, 100 miles per hour, the line drops sharply, showing the turbine's appetite for fuel shrinking as speed increases. But as the eye moves left into the territory of yard speeds and hill climbs, the line bends upward fast. Below 30 miles per hour, the turbine's consumption soars, more than doubling that of its piston-powered cousin. At a crawl, it's off the chart, burning through coal at a rate that left even seasoned engineers shaking their heads. One PRRS-2 test run clocked over 25,000 pounds of steam per hour just to get a heavy train moving compared to less than half that for a K4S. These numbers weren't just technicalities. They were the difference between a locomotive that could run profitably and one that bankrupted its owners. Engineers tried to rationalize the spike with talk of flow separation and partial admission, but the chart told a simple story. Turbines needed to run fast, or they ran out of money. The evidence was impossible to ignore. The very graphs that once promised a revolution now spelled out the problem in cold, unyielding numbers. For railway directors and shop foremen, 
The message was clear. No amount of optimism could flatten that curve. To harness the turbine's high-speed spin for railroad use, engineers turned to reduction gearing, massive gearboxes designed to convert thousands of revolutions per minute into the slow, forceful rotation needed at the wheels. On the Pennsylvania Railroad S2, the main shaft spun at nearly 9,000 revolutions per minute, but the drive wheels rolled at just over 400 revolutions per minute. Achieving this required a reduction ratio of 20 to 1, a mechanical feat that demanded precision engineering and flawless metallurgy. Every tooth on those gears bore the full brunt of the turbine's torque, especially when starting a heavy train or climbing a grade. Designers believed that with fewer moving parts than pistons and rods, these gearboxes would simplify maintenance. But the reality was far harsher. Under the relentless stress of daily service, gear teeth began to shear and chip. Shop logs from the S2's brief career record multiple incidents of stripped gears after just 50,000 miles, far less than the expected service interval. In Britain, the Turbomotive's reduction gears faced similar strain, with maintenance teams forced to rebuild or replace entire assemblies after only a few years in operation. Technical reports from Baldwin and Westinghouse detail the struggle to keep these gearboxes in working order. Engineers experimented with different alloys and heat treatments, but the combination of high torque, shock loads, and constant vibration proved too much for the technology of the day. Instead of the smooth, trouble-free operation promised in the design phase, railroads found themselves facing a new kind of mechanical headache, one that could sideline a locomotive for weeks while specialists machined replacement parts. The hope that turbines would reduce complexity gave way to the sobering reality of gearboxes under siege. Steam turbines brought a new kind of headache to the railroad shops. Every turbine relied on rows of precision blades, spinning at blinding speeds, carved from special alloys to survive the heat and pressure of locomotive service. But the reality of coal-fired boilers, wet steam, and constant stop-start running pushed these blades far past their limits. Metallurgy reports from the 1940s warned that blade life would be a fraction of what stationary power plants achieved. In practice, turbine blades and locomotives often lasted less than 10,000 hours, sometimes only a few months before cracks, erosion, or warping forced a complete teardown. The numbers told a grim story. On the Pennsylvania Railroad S2 and the British Turbomotive, maintenance logs showed that up to 40% of the time, these locomotives sat idle, waiting for repairs. Each overhaul meant pulling the entire turbine assembly, a job that could not be done at a typical roundhouse. Only specially equipped shops with skilled crews could handle the work, and even then replacement blades and rotors had to be custom ordered. One Pennsylvania Railroad shop foreman, quoted in a 1948 report, summed up the frustration. Turbines need brain surgeons, pistons, any mechanic. The downtime spiral did not just sap confidence, it crippled availability. While a conventional steam engine could limp along with a patched cylinder or a new valve, a chipped turbine blade meant weeks out of service and thousands of dollars in lost revenue. As the layup percentage climbed and shop crews scrambled for parts, the promise of lower maintenance vanished. For railroad managers, the message was impossible to ignore. The more advanced the machine, the harder it was to keep it running. Finance committees faced a stark reality by the late 1940s. On one side of the ledger sat the promise of turbine locomotives, machines that cost upwards of $700,000 each to build not counting the specialized shops and training needed to keep them running. On the other side, diesel electrics rolled out of EMD factories for $250,000 per unit, ready for service with off-the-shelf parts and no need for custom gearboxes or turbine blades. A single diesel could do the work of a steam engine with half the crew, and four units coupled together could match or exceed the horsepower of even the largest turbine experiment. Internal memos from the Pennsylvania Railroad's Cost Analysis Department, dated 1949, spell out the dilemma in blunt terms. 
turbine advocates argued for efficiency at speed, but the numbers refused to cooperate. Diesel fuel consumption held steady across the timetable, averaging 0.4 pounds per horsepower hour, regardless of speed or load. Turbines, by contrast, could double or triple that rate at low speeds, burning through coal or oil at a pace that alarmed even the most optimistic backers. Maintenance budgets ballooned as turbines sat idle, waiting for parts and expert labor, while diesels racked up miles with routine servicing and quick turnarounds. The cost gap only widened with scale. Railroads looking to modernize their fleets could buy three diesels for the price of a single turbine, then save again on fuel, labor, and repairs. Crew rosters shrank as diesels needed fewer hands in the cab and on the shop floor. For a railroad with hundreds of locomotives, these differences added up to millions in annual savings. The financial case was no longer a debate. It was an inevitability. As directors signed off on new diesel orders, the turbine's economic window slammed shut, setting the stage for one final desperate gamble. Norfolk and Western's John Henry arrived in 1954 with the weight of a dying era on its frame. At over 800,000 pounds and packing a 6,000 horsepower turbine, the locomotive was a defiant answer to diesel's triumph. A machine built to haul coal through the mountains with a force no conventional engine could match. Crews called it John Henry, after the steel driving legend, but the real battle was not against a machine. It was against the limits of steam itself. Shop logs from Roanoke detail a relentless cycle of hope and frustration. In the first months, John Henry's tractive effort was unmatched. It could shove mile-long coal trains up Blue Ridge grades, turbines howling as the mountain air filled with the sound of progress. But the promise faded as quickly as it arrived. By the summer of 1955, the engine was plagued by breakdowns. Coal dust fouled the turbine blades, warping them under the strain. Gearboxes screamed under loads they were never meant to bear. One entry in the maintenance ledger reads, Blade replacement. Entire assembly removed. Estimated return. Three weeks. Crewmen remember the smell of hot oil and the endless weights and sidings as mechanics crawled beneath the boiler, searching for the next point of failure. The John Henry spent as much time in the shop as it did on the rails. Over just 16 months of service, the locomotive's operational logs filled with red ink, downtime, overhauls, lost trains. Norfolk and Western's master mechanics, men who had kept steam alive into the atomic age, admitted defeat. The final tally was one year of revenue service, a million-dollar experiment, and a legacy of disappointment. On January 4, 1958, John Henry was cut for scrap. For the men who worked her, the end was personal. A farewell not just to a locomotive, but to the last dream of steam's future. Today, every modern locomotive still faces the same test. Can innovation justify its cost in the real world? Steam turbine engines remind us that technical brilliance alone never guarantees survival as railroads, like all industries, confront new energy and economic pressures. The lesson endures. Progress rewards not just the boldest ideas, but the ones that actually work. What future breakthroughs will clear that hurdle? Share your thoughts below.